Hello. This is the first time I've had this many people on the podcast. I am super excited. Ooh. Zen Genius, I have been following you guys for probably the last year. And I finally reached out because I'm like, I have to have these guys on the podcast because you guys are merchandisers as well. And our top rated episodes are always with other merchandisers or when I'm talking about merchandising. And I figured, what better time to have this whole team on? This is the most people I've talked to at the same time. So it's a little bit of a Brady Bunch screen we have going on. It's true, <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah. I'm going to have you guys go through and introduce yourselves and tell everyone what your job title is. And then I'll pitch a question and you guys can figure it out who's going to answer. <laughs> so let's Wonderful. start with Joe. I'll start. I am Joe Bear. I'm the CEO, creative director, and co-founder of Zen Genius. Then I'm Paul Cook. I am the other co-founder, uh, graphic design, brand identity, and sort of a little bit of gopher for all. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily Shirey. I'm the director of visual merchandising and events. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Jamie Shafraff, and I am the project manager of events and visual merchandising. Hi, everyone. I'm Jalpa Patel. I'm the lead designer and interior architect for Zen Genius. Oh, this is so exciting. You guys are so in depth. I feel so like, <laughs> we, I feel suddenly we so brought Mickey a, Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> we brought a little of everybody in today. I love it. I, I think that that's, I think that, because like I said, your, your body of work and how, what you guys do is so broad that I'm like, I, I really need to know. So yeah, this did. I just cut myself off. I really need to know what you guys do. And I think that our retailers are going to love this. So Joe, why don't you guys, why don't you both talk about how this started? And then I want to kind of dip back into what everyone's backgrounds are because you all have visual merchandising in your title. So an architect, and I really want to get down to that too. Great. I'll start with our, our elevator speech is that we are a creative agency and we specialize in visual merchandising, event merchandising or event design and creative direction. And we started the company in 1999. Wow. So next year is our 25th year. Hard to believe it. <laughs> really yeah. hard to believe it. None of this gray existed at that point. Yeah, see all this gray? This is why I bleach. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So yes, our um, business has really been focused on providing visual merchandising services to a whole range of type uh, retail clients, um, you know, different types of retail. We provide freelance merchandisers, contract merchandisers. So if you're a retailer and you just need some extra hands to come in and help you with the visual merchandising process, we are the company to call. We also have an events division. So we produce uh, corporate events, meetings, we'll do fundraisers, um, an occasional wedding here and there. And then our creative direction division is really helping to come up with the concepts. So some retail design work, visual merchandising programs. Um, when a client needs the creative support also, that's when we pull in our, our creative direction. So, so how, yeah. how did uh, you guys started the company together? How yes. did this come about? Were, did, were you already doing merchandising did you come out of a bigger company um yes yeah yeah well, both for a little me bit. it was it was much shorter for me i started um my first retail job ever was actually at henry bendel's oh. which i don't know how i landed that i, I bow down I miss it dearly i bow down and i was there for five years the first year actually was i was the manager of their house price department so i was just a salesperson no, and just no. Don't say just a salesperson. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> well, yeah, because I, I was the one person that the store manager and the visual person at the time they said they stood back and would watch me in the store, and I was the only employee that would move things around when I realized they weren't selling. Ah, so I love it. Was, it. Was this innate thing that I had, and they came up to me and, hey, do you want to try this? And I was like, I, what is it? Like, I mean, nobody at that point really knew what it was. You say visual merchandising and I don't know. But when they said, oh yeah, you don't have any sales goals. I was like, 
Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all know as merchandisers, we we all can sell, but it's like it takes away from what you're trying to actually do. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I did that for a few years and I was like, okay, I do love this. This is what I want to do. And I realized if I want this to be my job, my profession, I can't have bundles be my only experience. So I said, okay, let's try this. And I left bundles and I went to big box. So I went to Lazarus, which was one of the preceding companies that sort of ended up becoming Macy's. Mm. Um, so I did that for a few years and then I met this one. <laughs> How did you guys meet? Uh, in a store window. At Victoria's Secret. I was doing a display in That's the hilarious. window. <laughs> and Paul was walking up the mall. Yeah. And our eyes met. Who's that? So, yeah, oh, I love it. If, if you haven't figured out, we're partners. And it I is love it. starting the company. And y'all haven't killed each other yet. That's amazing. I know. <laughs> I work with It'll my husband. Here. It'll be here on your podcast and then your ratings will go way up, Michelle. I'm here. I work with my husband. It's like, I, I feel for him because I'm a merchandiser that is very, in, from I from anthropology, it's, I set my floors more intuitive. I don't go by a floor plan because quite honestly, you can't watch how people are walking through space. And our job as merchandisers for anthro was ear forcing the traffic where you want them to go. And like, so I have to actually be there on site. And he's like, can't you just put it on paper? I'm like, no, I need to see it. And he's like, God, that is going to be the kill. That's where he's going to kill me is when he's like trying to get an answer from me. I'm like, I need to see it and feel it. And he's just like, Jesus. I'm <laughs> with you though. It makes a difference when you get to see it and, you know, experience. So, so you guys meet and then you obviously both have an interest in visual merchandising. Yeah, my background was also department stores. I worked for Lazarus, and then I worked for a company called Broadway. You might know Broadway in mm -hmm. California, Broadway Southwest. And oh, wait, we, the Broadway? Yeah, the wow. Broadway. Wow, okay, that's Broadway, going Southwest. back. I know, see the gray? We told you. <laughs> bleach, <laughs> and then, bleach. And then I was in Arizona working with them, and then we became Macy's. Okay. And it was sort of in that time period where I thought, am I going to spend the rest of my life inside a mall? Mm. I started thinking <laughs> there, have, there has to be a need for visual merchandising outside of the department store world. And I was doing all sorts of like personal searching. And for whatever reason, I felt like this was a gift that I was given. And it's helping me to make a living and survive and all of that. So I started thinking then, you know, how can this idea come together? I called it Zen Genius, um, but I spelled it with an X because I was an X generation <laughs> and I wanted to disrupt things. Um, and then I ended up moving back to Ohio. I said the never word, I'll never go back to Ohio. Never and say I never. came back here. And I worked for uh, a big brand that's based here. And then I worked for a retail design firm called Shoot Gerdeman. And so although the seed had been planted a few years earlier, then we were able to start the company in 1999. And Paul was the, the cheerleader. And he said, yes, we can do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's yeah. Out of here. I have so many questions and it, and it's, okay. we're going to get to you ladies. I don't want to like, I, I, because I, when I left Anthro, my then husband about shot me. Cause it's like, I'm walking away from a 401k. I'm walking away from a very solid job. I'm walking away from health insurance. And I was like, I'm, I, for me, I'm not corporate. I don't know. I mean, it, it's like, I, I corporate, you have to really wrap things up in a nice bow, like as far as delivering bad messages. And we would do a floor set that would be the whole week. And I come in after the weekend and we were the second highest volume store and it would be trashed. And it was like, what the fuck happened? Like, you know, know. It's, it, if, and, it, and you first look at the numbers, like, okay, you didn't have that big of a weekend. What happened? Like we just set this and I never really worded that well enough. So I thought, okay, this is probably best for me to, egg. so I, I, when I started my own, I just literally, I had one client. When you guys jumped ship and you decided to do this, did you have a client yes. already? We had one client also that actually approached me and said, we have this opportunity. We think you'd be great at it. It's 
you know, they, they were looking for a consultant. They didn't want to hire somebody. So it was enough of a security net to take that, that leap. My mantra was with risk comes reward. Yes. I you, know, and, you know, it, I'm not proud of that, but we didn't have a lot of money when we started either, you know, so it was, debit cards. yeah, it was debit <laughs> cards and, and really just learning how to juggle and, make sure the client was happy. We started in the travel retail industry. So the first few years we were traveling around visiting gift shops in all of the airports. And the That's client amazing. had some great locations like the store on the top of the Empire State Building, wow. the Houston Space Center, New Orleans Aquarium. Yeah, some so, really cool ones. Yeah, That's, that's amazing. <laughs> it is it amazing. It, it, and do you, st do, and then how long did you stay with that client? Are you still working? Uh, the, and then where did it start to expand where you started to bring on the, the large group of people you have? The, um, that client, we worked with them for 20 years and then they restructured wow. and reorganized and they're not really in the retail game as much anymore. Okay. Um, I would say as a full time, just the two of us. I would say before the thoughts of really growing and getting bigger really was only about maybe three, three and a half years in because it was only the two of us and we were traveling 50 out of 52 weeks a year. Holy so people asked where you lived and it was like, well, we have a really nicely decorated storage unit in Columbus, <laughs> Ohio. Yes. It's not home, but. Wow. That yeah. is crazy. And thank God you guys were together. To <laughs> we I mean, they well got you guys together. had to each other. I mean, I can't even and, imagine being in a relationship and like, okay, bye, see you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we each have our own different strengths. And, you know, I always say that the travel has actually been great for our relationship because, you know, you, a little space is nice sometimes. And yeah, it always, have it always has focus. something to talk about because if you see each other too much, it's like, well, what'd you do? Oh, I know what you did today. <laughs> uh, where did you go oh i was with you yeah so it always gave us something to talk about it's true yeah we expanded quick i think it was more sooner than three years because we brought in a few people that first year yeah freelancers um in the beginning we were just hiring freelancers we didn't have employees at the time we really weren't interested in that we were just enjoying the the opportunity to work on our own um and we maintain that business model for about the first 10 years. Wow. And so we grew to the point that, you know, we felt we could take on, you know, a different type of employee and have benefits. How, but, how, at what point, because you guys have your hands in so many different things. What point did it go from just retailers into some of these other avenues? The first year, actually. Wow. The first year we were invited to do a special event, a big party, a fundraiser, a VIP uh, event. A friend um, knew what we were doing, um, said, would you be interested in doing that? And you, you know, from the visual merchandising world in the department stores, you were in charge of the events. So if there was a runway uh -huh. show or a luncheon or any type of special events, you would get pulled into doing that. So that first year we were invited to do this event. I, I can say was now- Was it the first year? Yeah, 1999. Oh, we, were, we were so um, naive maybe green? that we went for it. <laughs> yeah, and, well, I, I often say that it's like truly the best lessons in the way it's like, we can do it. Come on, we can yeah. do it. <laughs> and we did it. That first year it was- Oh, wow. I remember standing back and looking at the whole experience we created. And then after that, that one project led to another project, which led to corporate events, helping with um, sales meetings, um, helping with um, holiday parties, associate appreciation events. And I think because of our background in visual merchandising, we really understood a brand mm. and how to tell the story of the brand, bring the story to life. And, you know, in visual, you're also resourceful. So you're not, you know, you're trying to save money and find creative ways of doing things. So those skills really lent its, 
itself to the events world. And we found we were sort of bringing a unique offering to the to what was considered the traditional events world or florist shop that was doing other uh, events. So what was the first portion of expansion when you started to bring in the ladies that are here with us today? Gosh, these amazing women that are here today. Um, I would say after the first five years is when we really yeah. started to grow. And realize, um, yeah, we needed sort of an internal office structure. Mm -hmm. um, and so since 2005, we slowly grew. Um, in 2008 and nine is when we transitioned from having 1099 contractors to employees. Wow. And we started, I think, with eight full-time employees. And now we're up to 16 full-time Wow, that's employees. impressive. Yeah, and amazing. I mean, the the three that you have right here with you now, all yeah. three of them amazing. bring their own unique skills and, you know, their passions on board. And So which of the three was the first hire? And then I want to start with their back. Uh, Jalpa. 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 Okay. Well, yeah, architect was Jalpa. one of the, okay. Yes. Maybe one of the most brilliant people I know. Jalpa. Oh. Amazing. Thank you, Jamie. Um, yes, so I've been with Zen Genius. I think um, it's my eighth year this year. Um, wow. Yeah, seven plus eight years now. Um, a little background about me. Um, I moved to Columbus in 2015. I'm originally from Mumbai, India. I've been working on retail design projects in Mumbai. And then um, my husband decided to move to Columbus and I was um with him and I was uh, fresh off the boat initially and then <laughs> literally <laughs> and um and I met um I was just looking around and then I bumped into Zen Genius it was um I applied and you know we met and then I realized it was such a diverse design firm it had a mix of visual merchandising events retail design and I was like this is perfect with the past experience I've been had for working in retail design. Um, and then it just started off with there. And then it's been, yeah, eight years and I've been working on different retail design projects from visual merchandising to store interiors to window display design, fixture design, um, sometimes helping the events team with creative direction. So yes, everything wow. under the kitty. Yes. So what has been because uh, you know one of the projects that you guys had that i was like okay i love these guys this is where i was like i really like these guys the weed store you guys did <laughs> i'm like because it's been legal here in california for a while and there, there's one retailer that's really done it well like most of them are super creepy it's like incense burning like just like uh -huh. and there's one that's here in california called medmen and it's they've they've, they've said it's like an apple store of weed stores and and i don't know if you've been into planet 13 there there's one they are seriously like their merchandising and their case displays i was like okay i'm impressed like forget all the electric part like all the visuals they have as far as like the screen like they have huge screens in vegas and it's like it's really impressive, but their stupid case line displays. I was so <laughs> impressed by them. I'm like, okay, <laughs> God damn, they do some. Mer and to me, it's like, that's the biggest place to be able to make like, you know, add on sales. Why aren't they selling bongs? Why aren't they? <laughs> Not that I smoke weed, but it's like, I mean, there. it's like, it is a cash cow. And it's like, seems like there's huge opportunity to be able to really make. And when I saw you guys were doing this on a couple of retailers, I'm like, okay, that, that is brilliant. So did yeah. you do the architectural or were you building out the store did you do their fixtures like what was your role because I know you were involved in that um on that project I would let Joe Joe you could take the lead yeah and, yeah talk you, more about you know um the projects came to us originally we attended a conference called IRDC and there's an amazing woman in the industry named Megan Stone love her last name for the industry. Huh. Um, her company is called High Road Design out of um, Arizona, Scottsdale. And 
she started coming to the retail design conference and it was sort of a eye opener of what was happening in the industry. And they were building beautiful stores. The stores were really beautiful, you know, like little jewelry stores almost. But where it was falling apart was in the merchandising. And these were not traditional retailers with the tra traditional retail background. Mm -hmm. so we were seeing these great stores that maybe looked good for the first few months, and then they would start to fall apart. So we got involved in that. Um, and really, our niche has been focused on the visual merchandising. There has been some retail design elements and architectural design that we bring into it. Um, but I feel like for the most part, coming up with the merchandising, the case line accessories, the risers, um, trying to understand the flow of the customer and how to make this new and complicated product mm -hmm. easier for people to understand. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it was a unexpected aspect of business for us, even though we've worked with all types of retailers fashion, you know, hardline soft goods, hardware stores all over. So it was, you know, just a, looking at the retail formula from a new, new perspective. I, 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 it's when I think about merchandising, it's like, I always like, so when you approach merchandising a weed store and you're looking at case lines, what, what is, how are you approaching it as a, as a, merchandiser to make it easier is it signage is it it's i mean because it's it it's it's buds it's, yeah. it's you know yeah it's signage it's categorizing yeah. it it's um it's two part one it's understanding the products that are available in each category and maybe organizing or merchandising it so that a customer come come in and they can see everything in that that category whether it's the the flower, which is the weed, or if it's the the edibles or the tinctures. Um, and really, I feel like it, this shopper is continuing to evolve, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes it's just about featuring the different brands. Like you mentioned Planet 13, you know, their store is really about f celebrating the different brands that are in the store. Yeah. So it's understanding what the customer, how they want to position themselves in the market and whether it's their own product that they're featuring in merchandising or if it's other brands that they're bringing in. Um, but I feel like I always try to go back to, do I understand it? Can I look at this and easily understand what my offering or what the assortment is? More of an educational process for the because are you built did you make any props for that or you're like what is it what yeah. i mean i can't remember all the time i yeah. had some of your display I mean, so you're gonna have to like <laughs> <laughs> from a um initial standpoint one it's understanding what are the props they need for the cases you know what do we need sort of the core brand props the the elements the sign holders um, even the brand core decor package that, you know, the things that sit on the shelves. And just like other retailers now, we're giving them their core package. This is what you use day in and day out. But now for each season, here are some other elements that you can bring in for each season. And, you know, depending on the holidays, they're looking at their traditional holidays. You know, what are we doing for, for Christmas, for the holiday season? What are we doing for Valentine's Day? But then they also have some That's hilarious. Yeah, really Valentine's Day. You need the gummies for Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> we had some fun taglines for Valentine's oh, Day. Oh, it seems like everything we've done for them has been very tongue in cheek because of course we have that sense of humor also. It's like Valentine's, it might be like, you're my best bud. Like it, there was always yeah. these. I mean, I think it. I honestly like if you're. We're, I mean, the fact that I'm even having this conversation right now, it's like yeah. I'm sure. Like if my mother is listening, it's like, no, mom, I don't smoke weed, but <laughs> <laughs> but I know a lot about the shops. But it, I, I mean, I mean, that's the 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 greatest thing about I think the opportunity to be able to work with one of these operations is that it, it's kind of there are no rules. It's like 
and it it is fun. I mean, it's honestly like, I mean, I, I thought it was brilliant that the Girl Scouts were sitting outside of the weed shop selling cookies, but they got they got mm-hmm. called away from it. But yeah. I and mean, there are no rules. I mean, it's and that's the I think so much fun is that it's something a product like that that is fun. Yeah. And there, I mean, there are rules here and depending on what state you are in, it's definitely different. Um, It's been really interesting to watch the evolution of this industry also, you know, from going from all medical stores, which have a lot of rules that you have to follow, even about what products you're allowed to show. Mm. um, We encountered somewhere you weren't even allowed to actually show let's say the product, the flower. So here you are, you're sort of almost selling an idea is what you were selling Mm -hmm. of what they would experience. Yeah. So it became, it was very medical at that point because it was was selling white boxes. Wow. In here, I can only explain to you what it is. So there, it was, as he said, the sort of this evolution and depending, each state is different. Some allow you to talk about burning. Um, other states, you can't talk about burning. Um, so yeah, it just, it varies. So it's the beginning creative on how to work around those rules. <laughs> yes. I, I don't want to go too far down that ra- rabbit hole. because, <laughs> 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 But, but I, I, I will say that's what and I was like, okay, I need to have these guys on because you know. uh, so with the architecture portion of your abilities of what you're able to do, do you, are you building stores out? Is it, is it, I mean, because arc- I think of ar- working with the architecture I've worked with, but it's all been the exterior the interior the architectural portion of it is so tell me a little bit more about your job and when it comes to working with retailers if it's fixturing it's overall events yeah um so definitely how it works is you know when the the retailer or the client approaches us they give us a brief um whereas then genius we drive and lead the creative direction so What we do is we brainstorm design ideas. When it goes into the execution phase, we sometimes would partner with an architectural firm to bring our ideas to life. So, but uh, usually we we come up with the concept, we do all the 3D renderings, we come with floor plans, uh, we come with the look and feel, everything from soft furnishings to lighting selections to material specifications, um, and depending upon the scope of the project, how detailed is the project, we go into fixturing design, custom fixture design, custom lighting design. Um, and if, you know, again, bu- budget permitting, sometimes we'd make recommendations with our fixture partners. We would sometimes, uh, you know, see what's there in the market, see how it is more adaptive to the brand and speaks to the brand. So, um, after all of that, you know, we study and then we propose a package to the client, uh, touching on all the parts. And then that's how we, and then we go into the execution phase where again, we have um, actually a five step process in our design process. The first phase being brainstorming. Second one is more about feedback from the client. The third one goes into sourcing, uh, material selection, production files. Uh, The fourth phase is installation, where we go on site, um, oversee if it's visual merchandising, we're going install, installing everything, making sure, prepping up the store. And the fifth one is the follow-up stage, where after the execution, after the rollout, everything, we go back and see, is it working? Is it, you know, is, is everything that we designed speaking, creating the impact? To the desired impact and then making sure the design is a success so that's where uh um uh, five, five step process works I, I love that you guys follow up because i think a lot of i've always said it can look beautiful but if it doesn't sell it really doesn't matter and there's i think i don't know if there's a lot but there there are some merchandisers that i know that will go in and it's beautiful and ta-da and then they never like I always check back because I see my clients 
and I think the difference, and I, I don't, you'll have to tell me my, my side of my job is I work for wholesale gift showrooms and for retailers. So right now I'm walking into gift show mode. So I'm in a showroom here in LA. I leave for Vegas next week. I'll be living in that wretched place for a month, <laughs> month or so. <laughs> and then I'm back in retailers. Um, and I, my retailers, I'm with a lot of them once a month or every other week or something like that. So I, I, you know, I have a chance to see how it has sold through and what is working, what's not just physically looking at it and watching the traffic flow. And then if not, I, I will always call my clients. Like I want to see her four times a year. And it's like, I just want to make sure how's it going? Is it selling? Is it doing well? Is it like, is there anything we need to address next time? And it's a long time in between addressing something from when I said, when you're only seeing someone quarterly, but I love that you guys follow up. So if, if you guys have clients and they're like, Hey, whatever is not working, do you, as part of what you've pitched and part of your five start process, do you go back and fix it? Is that included? Is that another like, okay, we need to like adjust pricing or is it, cause that could get costly. Depends on where we lot. are on budget. Mm -hmm. of, of, we definitely always want to go back and fix it. And I feel like, again, you really, until you observe and see, you know, we're just, we think we're brilliant, but when the proof is when you really see the customers responding. Yeah. I, if we can go back and it's in the budget, we will. A lot of times that will then be an add-on, a way to, to continue um, or encourage our client. Oh yeah, you know, here's how you could change it. It's much easier to give a little advice mm -hmm. uh, to, to tweak something. Do you guys have clients that you're in their stores monthly or, you know, is it as a rotation? Yes, but that's mo mainly more of our freelance merchandising team that's going okay. into the stores monthly. Uh, the team that is gathered here for you is really working at our head office. So we're not necessarily going out as, as much as our freelance merchandisers. Are. Okay, interesting. Okay, let's go on to the next young lady that's, who's next? Yes. Uh, I'm Emily. Uh, so I started, um, I'm an art school kid. I went to Columbus College of Art and Design here in Columbus, Ohio, and got sucked into retail, being <laughs> in Columbus, the Mecca of the Midwest. So started my uh, visual merchandising career uh, with the Gap in stores mm. um, and really fell in love with, you know, window dressing and all those fun things. And uh Worked my way up into a corporate position with uh, Limited Two, which was a girls' clothing store, um, and got the opportunity actually to open the first Justice store. Uh, that brand evolved into that Justice brand. So I worked. With oh, I didn't know that was part of that brand. Yeah, so I worked with them for around eleven years. Wow. Uh, and then I spent uh, the second half of my career in um, corporate retail as well with Victoria's Secret before coming here to Zen Genius. Well, okay, but you don't mind me asking, how old are you? Because you don't look old enough to have that long, <laughs> that long of a career. I'm 48. Oh, wow. You look amazing. I mean, that's a long, lengthy, that's why, because I, you know, I, I think of the time I've spent in, in retail and it's like, it's, it's a lifetime of retail and it's, it's impressive. And you yeah. look like a baby. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I got out in just enough time to keep myself young. So that's right. right. <laughs> I rejuvenated myself here at Zen Genius. At what point did you leave corporate and jump to Zen Genius? And did you, did they find you or did you apply to them? So, so I found Zen Genius. Uh, this happened in 2020, right when the pandemic happened. Um Ooh. Uh, yeah, so I was out of work for a little while, and um, in the same day, I, as I continued my uh, job search, in the same day, two people told me about Joe and about Zen Genius, and um, so it was bound to happen, um, so we made a connection and started talking about, you know, my background and what I might be able to bring to the brand, and, you know, Joe's you know, it was during the pandemic, so we didn't have a lot of visual projects or events happening, um, but we did have a warehouse full of uh, visual decor, props, um, elements, and so there was kind of this dream about bringing uh, this ingenious marketplace to life, and so that's why I joined the team uh, during the pandemic, and we opened a store. Uh, <laughs> so we uh, created, we turned our warehouse at the time into 
uh, marketplace. We merchandised and curated collections with all of this product that we had. Um, we really believe in sustainability and um, giving back. And, you know, there's a lot of waste within visual merchandising and special events. And so we were able to curate these collections, uh, put a sales strategy together and do some warehouse sales um, and kind of liquidate some of that inventory and create some revenue for the brand. So that was that was my initial uh, role here um, when I came on. So you created the the so this the marketplace that you guys just had or you're about to have it, it, are you are these because it looks like there's gift and home products but are you also selling off old props that from events that you've had because yeah. so you you don't you actually produce the the props it's not like you go to a rental place and bring them you are the rental place so right. You, well, you have yeah. all of this at the warehouse. You you may or may not be using it. I'm assuming you recycle a lot of it like we all do, but what mm -hmm. you're not using, do you invite, is it retailers? Is it the public that's coming in? Cause that's the other part. I'm like watching this from afar. I'm like, what, what, I, this, what, this is where I was like, what do they do? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, there's been an evolution. I'll start and then I'll let you kind of go okay. through, but like uh, an evolution of kind of the pickoff of what the marketplace was. Initially, it was essentially these uh, upcycled um, decor elements and props. But um, as we've, it's a test, we're just trying to, you know, test and learn. We've been working with local artists recently. We started, I did start doing some wholesale buying and curating um, some gifting items. Uh, but during this process, we also moved to a new space with a storefront. Um, so that's oh. where, that's what is, what changed a little bit. Yeah. As if you're not doing enough, let's open a store. Right. Oh it's God. true. <laughs> You're right. Of all people to do it, this that would be so. The the as it's evolved, when you guys first started, were you inviting retailers to your warehouse sale, and and they're buying the props for their windows? I'm assuming. Yes, mm -hmm. it was retailers, clients, friends, a mix of people. Joe you know, has a lot of friends. I do have a I lot of friends. We have a lot of <laughs> friends. But originally, you know, before that, we used to have a prop sale once or twice a year. Okay. We would just get so full of stuff and we'd have a, a down and dirty prop sale inviting people in. So it was sort of that base of customers, which was a mix of, you know, clients, people, other visual merchandisers, other event planners locally um friends family that loved a good bargain people from the theater departments in town so it was that's brilliant <laughs> I, that really is smart i mean i don't i yeah. don't supply my props for my i i buy and they're their props at that point because some people call yeah. me like do you rent anything i'm like i don't want to carry anybody's crap around so it's like yeah. it, it is amazing to me though that you guys base do you basically rent it to them or is it how not so much. I mean, we work with a lot of renters, but nowadays, a lot of times you're buying things for an event or for an installation. And there's always been a afterwards, you know, we want to give the client the first option to take everything. You know, if we bought it for your event, you can keep it. Oh, but okay. in general, they don't, they don't wow. want, it. they just don't so, want to store it. You know, no. with both visual merchandising and events, there's a lot of stuff that just goes to the landfill. And so I, I was trying to put a pause on that. What what can we do to minimize that? How do we recycle through inventory that we have? How do we create almost a machine? Like we buy something, do we want to reuse it? If we don't want to reuse it, you know, can we shift it into the store and sell it? Um, and, you know, then after that, what do we want to do with it? We'll still have our big annual prop sales a couple of times a year. So it's trying to get the most out of our inventory. It's trying to pay attention to sustainability and support, you know, the good of reselling items. As Emily said, it's also been an experiment for us. It's been an opportunity to even develop some new products um, where we're located now. And we're in the short North, which is the arts district and one of the um, revitalized neighborhoods in Columbus. So we also started to offer more 
souvenir type products for people that are visiting the neighborhood. Um, wow. Ultimately, creative gifts for creative people. It, I love it. In general, what we were focusing on. So your storefront, the, it, it plays also yeah. for your marketplace. Now, do you bring in other people for this marketplace? Is it like other creatives bring their stuff like almost like a, a fair? So there's kind of two parts. Uh, we started out last year. Uh, we did a couple, what we call a summer market, a, you know, fall market where we invite other vendors in. Uh, other makers, artists uh, to do just like a one day pop up. And so they uh, we've done it in our parking lot, also in the back warehouse. So there was an evolution with that. We've done five of those now with different um, with with vendors, but we're also looking at consignment in the store. So some of those um, people that we've met through the, the markets, we've been able to invite them in to sell their goods in the store. And so they get a percentage of um, what sells. Yeah. So it's a mix of both. It that's been wonderful. It's almost like creating our own mini gift shop. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's so, awesome. and then once a season, we get to meet a lot of the local vendors, crafters, makers, um, you know, and invite them into the store. Wow, that is like I love that. And what a great use of the space, too. I mean, if you've got a storefront on the front, you might as well, you know, make use yeah. of it. And gosh, Michelle, we're learning. And I just have to say that your last podcast that I listened to, <laughs> you know, the set chop, get ready for that. Yeah. It's been so helpful. Just oh, good. really just reminders, you know, this started during the pandemic. And, you know, one of the reasons was we had a whole team of employees that we wanted to keep, you yeah. know, working. So it was a part of our pivot plan, something that Paul and I had always talked about. Mm -hmm. What would our store look like? What, what would the concept be like? So it's been able to evolve. But then, you know, once projects started picking up, it's like, oh, gosh, we have a store. Now we've got to work. Yeah. It. it almost requires a full time staff. Yeah, so, I can imagine how how challenging that because it's like I think everybody got I mean myself included it's like that was the greatest vacation of I'm sure I piss a lot of people off when I say that but I mean honestly it's the most time I've ever had off in my life and it was like you know sitting in the backyard in this weather drinking wine like eating salads out of my backyard I mean it was like it was amazing yeah. But then soon as travel opened back up and soon as like somewhat of like I was back on planes I was like the only one on the plane, but I was back traveling. I was back doing, cause the gift shows got up and running relatively quick. There wasn't really anyone at them, but all the yeah. showrooms were like, we can't do a ton, but we need you to. So all these little side things I was doing and enjoying just like went completely out the window. I was like, yeah. <laughs> all right. Back. Ex it, you know, I'm excited is what it's led to. And now, you know, we're looking at curating this boutique, a great little shop. We're enjoying it. You know, I'm excited. We're working on a show now also called ASD, which is in Vegas. Yes. We'll be there. And, you know, we're realizing one, we're coming, we've helped before as a merchandiser going into the show. Now we're in the process of helping them create their neighborhood guides, you know, that talk about the vendors and what's happening in each of the halls. So, we're excited to go there this year and we have a whole new perspective because yeah. now we're not just thinking about the merchandising, but we're also thinking about the buying, you know, how to shop a show, yeah, you, you know, how to go through the show. Really that last episode that you did, it was fantastic for that. Anybody so that's glad. to visit a trade show or a gift show. It's fun. I just kind of assume everyone knows all that. And then I realize, no, they don't like, you know, just put, I, cause I, the biggest one was putting completion dates on your shipments and, and making sure, cause the reps are like, yeah, take the order. Boom. It goes in. As soon as it goes into that system, Literally, we'll get notifications that something's shipping the next day, at least for the apparel that is coming out of California fast fashion. It's like, whoa, 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 we had a delivery date on that. And it's in because everyone's so rushed and we have so many people with the C, it's like, OK, let's get the paper. Or the other one is is when they're not there's no printers now, like a lot. And it's like, OK, can I get can I get a copy of my order? Well, we'll email it to you. And it's like a week later, like, 
hi, I need my PO and PS it's already shipped. And now my receiver doesn't even have anything to, I mean, it's it, that part it's, I, I hopefully was the most help for people because yeah. I just assume everyone knows that. And then I realized, no, I guess everyone doesn't, but it, it's, so you got, you're going to be helping a ASD. ASD. Yes. We're uh, creating their neighborhood the guides. I love so it. The document that says, this is what's in the beauty hall. This is what's in the home and gift hall. These are some highlight vendors. And then in the main registration area, we're creating uh, sort of artistic visual displays for each of the nine neighborhoods. Oh, it's great. It's, yeah. it's much, it sounds like it's going to be much better than when I visited it. Because I, I happen oh, yeah. to I, it cross over and I I was everyone talks. I mean, it's it's sort of a shit show because it's like it's just everything and it's it's off price goods and it's like beanie babies next to the vegetable like yes. shredders. I mean, it, it was so it's and, a lot. And you, but they've got amazing deals. I mean, it's like, if you have enough time. So I was like, I'm going to go, I want to see, because I know the profit margin on half of that stuff is amazing. And which is really the way, the reason to go, you know, you yeah. might, if you're a fashion store, you might go to magic and you might get, a that's when we crossed over. There. Yeah. But if you go to ASD, this is where you're going to find some of those great margin items, yeah. those items to cross merchandise, those impulse items. So, but I love yeah, that you're doing I've learned a lot guide because just going there, it was like, where, what am I doing? I mean, it was, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot to take yeah. in because it wasn't organized like magic or the gift show. So it's great to hear that you guys are doing that. It's that's, that's a, that's a fun yeah. project. Too, but. Okay. Um, I now the last person to, for us, Go you're, on. Yeah. you're on. We should all grab a cocktail at this point. <laughs> I got a long list of career here. Um, so I uh, grew up on an organic dairy farm in Ohio. Um, oh. Ended up uh, working for Walmart for four years. Oh. Um, every department within that store. I'd never heard of it before when I started working there. Um, I did graduate with a hospitality degree. Went into hotel management. Wait, I had to back up on Walmart for a second. What? <laughs> Tried to go fast. Well, you started there at how old? 16. And what job did you get hired in as? Originally um, as a cashier, but then okay. I ended up in like HR. I ended up doing special events for them. I ended up in every department. I love that. Including in Worcester, Ohio, which is pretty much a stick town. <laughs> um, I ended up like even selling guns. I mean, wow. <laughs> thing I am totally again. Cashier to um, <laughs> But this happened. This is real. Um, okay, I had I just had to ask that. Don't yeah, mean to interrupt no, you. So I was there for four years. I don't Originally, think you put that on your resume, I Jamie. I, I keep it tight. Um, <laughs> but I made really good money there. Um, I'm not gonna like sugarcoat that. I actually did well. Um, I would also go on to work for Gap for a hot minute. Um, and that was, uh, that was, you know, I, I really always enjoyed like telling people what to wear and what didn't look good, what looked good. Um, I would go on to work for Hyatt Hotels in Detroit. Um, it was a big box and uh, that was really the start of my hospitality career. Um, from Detroit, I moved to back to Columbus, Ohio. I worked for, it's really the Convention Visitors Bureau. It's really bringing um, convention business mm -hmm. to this destination. Um, it really promotes tourism, travel. Um, so I was in, I had a sales background. I was there for a good chunk of time, long enough to know better um, in terms of like how things run as a community, as community development, working with the um, governmental, the corporate and the community to bring events to the community. Um, we are noted as the 14th largest city in the United States and also the third in terms of the fashion capital. So there's a lot. No, of I had no idea. In here, there really is, um, and it has just this great portfolio of uh, businesses from um, food industry to in, um, to uh, IT to fashion to um, I mean insurance, large big insurance corporations here. Um, from there, I would go on to work for American Court. It's a um, the North America's largest horticulture trade association. I oversaw their sponsorship, their exhibit um, 
showroom, which was the 150th largest in the U.S. Wow. Um, I also represented um, the horticulture industry for North America in our global events. Um, and we also manage the Ohio Produce Marketing Growers Association in American in Bloom, which is the beautification of communities through plant material. Wow. Um, and then we would um, consolidate with a company called American Nursery Landscape Association out of D.C., which brought us to the table of um, when things are happening on the Hill. Um, and then from there, I would go on to work for Girl Scouts USA in New York. Um, and that, I heard you say Girl Scouts, so I know them very, very well. I was, there I was one. There. <laughs> you were one? All right, there we go. Um, uh, and uh, was their project manager for their largest event, which is about 13,000 people globally. Um, so I oversaw that program. From there, um, essentially, well, um, COVID, um, well, not yet. I actually went into real estate in New York. Jesus so Christ. <laughs> what I learned uh -huh. about that. You are well-rounded. I know. That's why I said get a cocktail, get a glass of wine. There we go. Um, <laughs> what I learned from that is that I'm not a shark. You, it, to be in the real estate world in New York, you have to be a shark. I am like this Midwestern person who's like, oh, yeah, they're going to come back with their deposit. And they're like, no, they're not. No, they're not. And so it was like, I just wasn't cut out for that kind of shark tank. Um, and then COVID hit. And from there, um, I've had, uh, I've known of Joe. Joe, is, Joe and Paul are very um, connected to the community. Um, they sit on board of directors within the community of Columbus. Um, I have um, a plethora of siblings and come from a Mexican Irish Catholic background. So there's a ton of us. Um, we're taking over, FYI. The Shaprat um, sisters. sisters. Get ready. I'm so, Mexican uh, Irish. Apparently, I thought I was Mexican German, but my mom did that test. I'm Mexican Irish. <laughs> oh, you are. Okay. Yeah. I am Mexican German Irish. So, um, so with that, German Polish. German Irish. Oh, oh, I love it. German yeah, yeah. American. <laughs> I'm recovering. <laughs> Catholic, is I, <laughs> um, but uh, with that, with that is that you know Joe Paul are very connected to the community, um, and it's it's abundantly clear um, in so many different ways. Whether it's like the give back that they do, or the friendships that they have. When I say they have a massive network, they have a massive network of friends. I happen to be <laughs> so fortunate to be a part of that massive network, um, and I have a sister that work for Zen is now working for IBM. And, you know, they're just, when you come out of Zen, you just, you have this great, 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 great um, resume, if you will. Um, with that though, is that I have 27 years of event experience. Um, I am, uh, and I, and I really have seen events through multiple lenses. So whether that is on the city development side, whether that's within um, a nonprofit organization, whether that's on the hotel end, within the convention centers, um, also within like a global side, I have wow. this view of how events come together in this really macro and micro way. Um, coming on board with Zen was like, this is like a diamond, I'm telling you. Like the event design that comes out of Zen is a diamond. I, I would say that in my entire career, um, I've never had people that are on site that are visual merchandisers on an event. They look at things through a different lens than event management people. Event management people, I think we've just been kicked down so hard that's here are all of the rules. And then you have a visual merchandiser who comes in and says, well, here's how people shop. Here's uh -huh. how people buy. And so when you merge the two, what you have is this, like, you have this thing that I think is so unique in our community. Um, and what I would also say about that is that we have, you know, these conventions, if you will, that, that um, they have a product and they need to showcase it to their consumer. And so where the really, the, there's some sweet spots that we have where we're merchandising, um, or creating experiences for these um, collective customers 
for their people to go through and experience the product. So a lot of money is in this. It's a massive industry. Um, and we're, I mean, it is, it is, um, it's really super exciting to be on a team that A is so nimble, but also has a whole different perspective. Yeah. Um, and it's really, really cool. So give me an example of of an event where you're as an event planner planning and then a merchandiser comes in and explains some of that different perspective and how it plays into an event for some of these bigger conventions or well, events. I mean, as a project manager, it's really like I am a cat wrangler because these they're, they're so creative. Wow. They're so <laughs> creative. You know, and it's and it and there's a budget to adhere to, there's timelines, and our timeline doesn't move. You know, so if you're doing an event, that timeline is just not gonna move. Yeah. Like a store opening could change or what have you, but um and in terms of how we create that, and we have the same five step process that Jalpa shared. And that is that, you know, we come in with our, our concepts. So we've had a collective call with our client and they'll say, you know, I'm thinking about having, you know, here's, here's our, you know, just I, give us something. Here's the look and feel. We take that and we start creating, like, here's three different options. This is how we can go. This is the road we can start building going down that street. Um, and, and then with that, when you, then when you're bringing in that visual merchandising, it's like, we're so attuned to the detail and that detail really then transforms into a macro view. So it's like, they have it. And I'm not the creative. I say this because like I'm working with like genius. That's what we're called. Um, and <laughs> you know, um, I'm working with genius. What I'm just trying to do is say, okay, taking that and saying, okay, how do we bring that to life mm. for a three hour event? make sure everyone's safe, make sure that we have the support that we need. Um, we're doing build outs, we're doing, um, you know, we're doing, a, um, you know, whether it's a runway show meets a um, rock and roll festival meets um, headliners um, meets like, what is it that you want people to walk away feeling? How do you want them to feel? What do you want them to say? And then creating experiences to make that happen. How, what, what as creative wise, what does it look like to sit in on the first meeting of you've got a client, we are having a party, it's our 50th anniversary, or, or whatever. And we kind of know what we want. Like, what does it look like when you guys take it back to the office with all of your involvement? Yeah. It's fun. It's so fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. That's so one fun. of my favorite parts of the project. One, it's it's fun when you're hearing the client because they always have a little idea, a vision or something that they want to create. And then it's like trying to think of all the different ways that you can get there. So we come back and, you know, one, we'll get together as a group and we're all throwing ideas onto the table first. And then I think we all like to go have our own space and then let those creative ideas develop a little bit more. And then we usually get back together and we try to narrow it down. Usually we try to show a client three different ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, the first one is usually we hear you. Here's what we we were listening. This is what we want to give you. The second idea might be we heard you, but we think this could take it to the next level. And the third idea, it has everything, but it also might have a few of the wows. So Option one might even be the most affordable option. So we're given a, a low, medium and uh -huh. range. And then, you know, that process is fun. Then we get together with the client. We show them the three different options. That also helps us get all of our ideas in. We have a lot of creative minds that are working together. Yeah. So by showing three different options, you know, a lot of times we're able to get everybody in that mix and then when the client reviews it a lot of times they choose they say i want a little of this idea from option a and i want some of this from option b and this extra fifty thousand thing that you threw in over here for a giant screen mm -hmm. i want that too yeah or a drone show or a drone show yeah, yes a drone show 
We just did our first drone yeah. show. What is a drone a show? Drone. You like know the, the fireworks. The things, Dancing the drones. Fly. Yeah. Huh. The, the little battery operated thing that flies around. Yeah. Well, I know what a drone is, but what is okay. a drone show? Now <laughs> there are companies that will you can hire and they'll create a show for you for your client or your event. So we just did one with a hundred drones right on the river, the Scioto River with the skyline of Columbus behind it. Wow. And, you know, they they program the drones to create formations. Sometimes they look like fireworks. Wow. Do your company's logo. So I've never seen anything like that here in California. Yeah, that's an add-on. Well, I'm sure you'll see it. Yeah, on the drone level, I can go down any rabbit hole you want. But on the drone level, what's nice about it is it doesn't have fire. So like I can see it taking off in in California. So for all the listeners out there that want to invest in something in California, like fireworks is yesterday, the drones is today, and that is that they're not interesting. So the yeah, the drones is because it doesn't leave um so much um pollution in the air. Yeah, also we were very cognizant of the sound that fireworks gives off, and we were doing this in a downtown. And it was in the evening. It has to be when the sun starts going down. So instead of having a firework display, which is also still very exciting as July 4th is upon us, um, drone shows can be just as exciting, um, just in a different way. How cool. Yeah. Fire, with us for fire fire hazard, like we we just yeah, we, don't really have have a, we don't really have any. Yeah. No. <laughs> so I think that when we go through those phases on the event side, we have to make sure that we can access the material. I think that that's the one thing that um, that is something that you have to be very cognizant of. If you're pitching it in any of the three images or three uh, options, you can actually access that material. Yeah. So there's a little, there's some just slight differences on, in terms of in terms of we're not, or sometimes we're creating it, so we will be building it, or we'll you know so what have you. So I think on that on that side, it's to make sure that. You know what we're what we're showing, and when we think we're we're giving them the wows, um, and that's always very very important is what is the wow in this project, um, that that you're able to actually create it. Do you the need, that you're given. so once the client says I love this one, let's do this, then yeah. it goes to obviously planning. Do you are you guys because you have so many people involved? Like, are you're actually building the props in house? Like, you're not having to source mm -hmm. it from. Do you have a wood shop and carpenters and like are those all freelance guys or that part of your yeah. employees? I think this goes back to having this wonderful network within the community. I think you know Joe and Paul really believe that when one tide rides, we, or one tide rises, we all rise. And so we do reach out to the community on, um, you know, maybe we've met someone that has a wood shop that we think that they would be great for the project. So that we have a plethora of vendors that we work with within the community, which I think is, you know, one of our, one of our true strengths is that the word of mouth on how we obtain business is tremendous. Yeah. So that's oh, yeah. really a huge way of how we how we obtain business, which is, I mean, one of our clients um, basically said, "Who did that event? That's that's an elite event within within the industry. Who did that one? It's like, well, Zingenius did it, and it's like, well, that's who we're hiring. So it's kind of like once you, it's kind of like the way the the the, or the company started, which is like one thing led to another that led to another that led to another, and if you provide an outstanding experience each and every time it's it, you know the sky's the limit well what i love is because like i said like i i've been in retail for 45 47 years i've been in retail since i was 14 and i'm 57 now and it's like but i i have not moved day over 20 <laughs> thank you <laughs> It's the Mexicans. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, I've never, I've kept more or less in my arena. And I think that's been a hinder and a, and a, a plus. I mean, it has kept me not, not growing, but it's like, I, I it's, I'm a one man show. I mean, I have my husband's a contractor. I have people that I pull in to do certain jobs with me, but it, I have not moved past into all these other arenas. And it's like, to see that growth is incredible. It's like the the closest thing I've come into like decide like I'm gonna 
is this podcast is is yeah. and this was a fluke on doing lives during the the pandemic and then oh i'm going to start a podcast i have no idea what i'm doing i can talk okay. and and i i finally am like okay maybe i am branching out to something else but like what you guys have done as merchandisers by trade and all these other avenues that yes merchandising visually i think vis- merchandisers see things in a visual way like you were saying in a totally different way and it and now I think about like how much it lends itself to all these other businesses is brilliant. I mean, really like tapping into all these different categories is like, is so brilliant. It, and that's why I think at, when I'm looking at you on, on Instagram, I'm like, what are they doing? Like, I could not figure, I literally could not figure it out. And now talking to you guys now, it makes so much sense on how freaking brilliant it is. Like, and, and so I guess my next question is like, what is next for, for you guys? Because you obviously you're doing a lot of different things. Like at what point do you say, okay, we've got it reined in. We do these six things like, but something tells me that you're not going to stay in those boundaries. (laughs) No, (laughs) we won't. I mean, yes, we will. One, the diversity is wonderful because we can go from one type of a project where you pour yourself into it and then you flip over and you're doing a whole nother type of experience. Yeah. So those creative challenges yeah. keep it very interesting. Yeah, and if I can if I can add within that, Joe, I'm sorry, is that what happens with that with the corporate setting is that when one thing is down, another thing is up. So like events may be high yeah. and digital merchandising is steady. Yeah. So it's it's almost like this ebb and flow of opportunities when the opportunity arises. Yeah. So sorry. That's no. me with merchandising gift gift show and then retail. Cause once yeah. the gift shows are done, then retail's ramping up for fourth quarter. It kind of has Yeah. I've that, kind of been able to ride that little wave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That ebb and flow has been there for us from from the beginning. And kind of in the beginning was just visual merchandising and events. And those played off of each other. Um, so that's been helpful. What's next is a really interesting question and a kind of a hard question because, you know, we turn 25 next year. Congrats. So there's the wow card. I know there's the wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. wow. Wow, mom. Wow. <laughs> These, this is Paul developed this set of cards during the pandemic. These little... We call them the virtual emotion cards. So when we I were all... love that. We were all doing these Zoom calls. We could, like, you know, hold up different signs. <laughs> I so. love that. For those of you who are not watching on YouTube, <laughs> you really need to because these cards are brilliant. It's, it's yes. what's missing from my... <laughs> this is the most important one. <laughs> that I need that for my, right? for my podcast because I'm looking at people. I'm like, I can't hear you. <laughs> and they're like searching around. It's like, I've literally had like, can you just text me your cell phone i have to walk through on the phone with them at the same time yeah we'll send some michelle yes oh my god i would love that so so next yes next um one it's celebrating what we've created and what we've accomplished over the years i think you know in a way we've been so busy now having a chance to sort of stop and look back and say wow you know holy holy shit, look what we did. No doubt. And now I'm excited to see how the Zen Genius brand can start to evolve. So even with the marketplace, our store that we're we're creating, you know, I'm seeing an opportunity to create a line of products and a gift in gifts. So I'd like to see, you know, where we can take the Zen Genius brand. I feel a passion for the visual merchandising industry And I want to help to encourage future creatives Mm. that know that there is an opportunity to earn a career and a lifestyle in visual merchandising. Jamie mentioned I'm on a nonprofit called PAVE, which is planning and visual education. We're trying to connect um, students and educators with the retail design and hospitality design industry. Is that just in, in your area or is that nationwide? No, it's actually global. P-A-V-E global.org. Um, we have a huge base in New York. 
Um, and then, you know, we, we do all sorts of design competitions for students, help them design fixtures, give them opportunities to network and mentor with them. Wow, the that's amazing. So I want to keep cheering on visual merchandising as a career opportunity, or even now visual merchandising and event merchandising is, as we've tried to coin that, that term. Um, so I feel like we've been blessed in order to create this. And now we, you know, are in an opportunity where we can say, wow, what can we do with this now? Where do we go? I love, I think it's so, I've say this a lot on the podcast is that I think it's so incredibly important to give back and, you know, whether it's time or money or, or mentoring, I, I think all of that is so important. And I think it's, you know, not just important as a business, but it's important as a human. And it, it's, I have, we've talked to so many people that are all giving back in some way or another. And I think it's, I love, I love hearing that. Cause I think it's so incredibly important and, yeah. and being involved with your community. I mean, I've talked to more people that are involved in, cause I was never involved in, you know, the business associations and when I, cause I had stores at Fred Siegel in Santa Monica for years. And it's like, I never went to those meetings. I never, and it's like in talking to so many owners now and how involved they are. And it's like, why would you not be involved in your community? And it's like, I wish I, I wish I knew that back then when I was 27, but you know, I, I, I was too wrapped up in, I'm a Fred Siegel owner that, you know, unfortunately <laughs> that was not part of my, but I think it's, I, I, I think that's brilliant. The, the mentoring part is just incredible. Yeah. Great. I, I wore my shirt in honor of you today. Because on your podcast, you said, we do more than make it look pretty. Yes. We I help love you it. drive sales. I love the creative as fuck t-shirt too. But... <laughs> do you sell that? Yeah. Okay. This actually has become a great, like a lot of visual teams are I buying need, for their I whole need staff. that t-shirt. I have to ask you guys, because obviously fourth quarter's coming up. Well, one, I have two questions. How come you're not doing sh gift showroom setups? Because- you know, that it's like, that is a natural transition for me. It's got to be a natural, especially since you guys build the props. You, I mean, like you do it all. Like it just hasn't come up yet. More than anything, I've done education for the shows. Hmm. I have a yeah. list of initials, organizations and trade shows that I've been to teaching about visual merchandising, but we haven't really worked in any of the I'm areas. really surprised because mm -hmm. honestly if you it's want, if any of your listeners want to call us uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they can call us and we'd be happy to go through our five-step process I mean <laughs> truly like it's I and I have to wonder because gift gift showrooms change twice a year and it's yes. it's not really permanent I mean it's like an event I guess in the sense of it's not permanent but it's like it it you have a week to change it out. It It's like most of the, for me, I change everything and we, some of it, some whole sections move around. Most of the time, most showrooms just want to leave it put and it's just the overall visual is changed out and you're switching out samples and whatnot. But it just seems like that would be one of those, one of those projects that, you know, a, a wholesale showroom, which a lot of them listen to us as well as their some of our, our sponsors, but it just seems like that would be a perfect, it's like, you're a one-stop shop. I mean, yeah, you guys it's really great. do it all. Again, when I was listening to your podcast and hearing about how you do it, there was a little bit of a light bulb. Oh, wow. Yeah. We, we haven't tapped into that yet. Like we actually wrote a merchandising guideline book for ASD for people that have booths there. But Thank God <laughs> haven't, haven't haven't worked hands on um, with any of the showrooms yet. So yeah, my, I don't do a lot of temp spaces. I've done a couple, but temps, you know, it's it's a little more challenging because the timeline. It's like you know, thirty six hours or whatever they have to set it up. And I I do mostly permanent showrooms, which okay, yeah, they're a little bit more substantial. There's a little bit more meat. You can do bigger things. It's it's not so like one and done and tear, tears down and goes away. But like you guys for sh like for showrooms that are because Las Vegas is like one of the biggest Atlanta Las Vegas. 
I think are the two biggest now. Dallas is very yeah. big as well. I just came back from Dallas and it, it's like, they're all permanent showrooms and there's always people moving in that need full mm-hmm. service. Like a lot of them don't, I mean, I've worked for people. They're like, we have, we've never had a showroom. Like yeah. this is what we, this is what we have. This is our line. And it's like, it, it it's, you guys are so perfect for that. I mean, just like I said, you're a one-stop shop. So wholesalers, if you're listening, <laughs> You'll Give have us all the information call. in the notes. <laughs> Give us the right people on with it. I have to ask everybody the same question I ask everybody at the end, which is where do you all, because you all are very creative, like where do you find inspiration? And we'll start where we started last time. We'll start with the boys and then we'll go around because I want to hear where, because it, I know. And that was my thing today is like, you need to get out and get inspired. Where do you get? I mean, gosh, it is a tough question, but I feel like I find inspiration everywhere. And I know that kind of a little vague, open, but (laughs) it's a little vague, but I do like um, one, if I'm out shopping, I'm constantly being inspired by other things that I see people doing. Sometimes when I go to the museum, I see something and I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. How do we translate that? Mm -hmm. My main source of inspiration is nature though. Mm. I need to shut off. I need to go outside, you know? So to me, seeing, being in nature, seeing things and just having that space is probably my best source of inspiration. And actually... It would be unfortunate to say, but I would almost mimic exactly what he said. That's why we get along, Michelle. <laughs> but it, but it is. It's the, I mean, you can find inspiration anywhere through music, through books, through film, through conversation. Um, but, but yeah, mostly it's like you need to be able, you have to know when you have to balance it with a, a walk in nature, just sitting in the sand. Like it's, you have to be able to find that inspiration anywhere because we're all different. Well, it's so. also, for, I used to ask, where do you find balance? And everyone's answer was like, there's no balance. So I stopped asking that question, but, you, <laughs> but for you guys, like in the height for you two who are in the, like when you are in the height of fourth quarter and you have events going for holiday parties and you have a holiday wedding, and then you have, you know, now you have a retail space and you have all these things like, how in that moment, I'm going to ask you guys for the, for the balance, like where, like where, how do you turn it off? And how do you, at the end of the day, lower your cortisol level? How do you calm down? Like, what does that look like for you guys? For me, it's, it's somewhat easy. Only I can say that because you've met three of the people we work with here and it's you've always been told they tell you surround your people with surround yourself with people smarter than you boom 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 here they are all around so i'm next to them too (laughs) (laughs) so yeah it's it's just nice to like when we look around our office i mean there's always so much laughter here like we all care about each other like well People hang out outside the office. You go to personal things like, oh, my son is selling flowers. Okay, everybody in the office, let's buy flowers. Or I mean, it could be anything. It's like so, family. Yeah, it really is. And yeah. I don't know. It's it's easy to walk away from those things because I know the people who are we're surrounded by are taking care of these things with as much heart and detail as we are ourselves. So yeah. Hey ladies, who's, who's the first question on, on now we're going to, now we're going to ask balance and, and inspiration. Balance and inspiration. <laughs> Cause obviously you are holding a lot of the weight. So <laughs> how do you guys yeah. calm down? Um, <laughs> <I've> been- <laughs> just kidding. Not really. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Um, let me start with inspiration. I think for me, inspiration comes, um, With a lot of travel, I get inspired, travel. Travel has been my biggest source of inspiration. And uh, what connects to travel uh, is culture. I feel, especially with me having this global influence of working in retail, 
in the United States, in India, doing projects in Europe, in the different parts of the world, I just feel that uh, the cultural influences that retail has in how that translates into design, it's amazing mm. to see um, how local, how regional, and how diverse design can be because of these influences. And uh, that just makes it more strong when I travel. I, you know, when I'm traveling, looking at different, even if it's a city, what's the local vibe? Why is a particular color so prominent in this part of the country? Why is it, you know, why is it, why the houses are designed, you know, there's the geographical location and so, so much influences to design. And then you understand in the end, it's the people that you design for. And that's how, and then the culture, the location, the region make the people. And that's how, for me, inspiration comes from that. So. Um, I love that you look at travel or you look at architecturally and a house's color. I love that you look at it from a totally different scope than I think most of the people traveling look at it. Like it, it's such an incredible way of thinking about about what how you just verse that I, mean, I can't I, I mean that was a beautiful way you just phrase that yeah um in balance um oh my gosh um retail design can be sometimes you know sometimes it's overwhelming sometimes it's like you're you know just how do you like you you think you concept the ideas don't come at the same time but sometimes you're like boom there's so much energy there's so many ideas and you just want to spill them out um balance for me comes with um recognizing what works at the right time you might have so many things going on but what is something that is required at that moment translates for me into keeping that you might have 10, 20, 30,000 ideas, but what does the client need? What needs to execute and what works? So it's more about priority for me at that moment is how I kind of like remove all the clutter, all the distraction, what needs to work. Problem solving, that's where I feel like, okay, I just need to gather it, bring this, and then this is what we do. So for me, it's it's about bringing that and trying to find that balance. So... That's smart. I mean, I, I think it, being able to, and when you look at everything that you have on your plate and being able to focus on what is the priority for right now, because all the rest of it is not right now. And it it's like, I always say, like, there's clients that I know that don't leave their stores ever. And it's like, you need, it's going to be here tomorrow. Like you need to, and at some point you need to take care of you. And it's, that's a really smart way of being able to say, this is what I'm focusing on right now. I have ADD, so I I really am going to try and take that to to my day because I I really honestly I get so spun out on like how many different things I have going on. Like, just think about what is happening now. Yes. Yeah. I'll go next. Uh, I think I'm. I need to echo a little bit of what Joe said, but I think I find inspiration in a lot of things every day and looking for new ways to be inspired, whether it be I'm driving into the office, maybe listening to music might trigger something for me. Um, looking at the skyline when I drive into the city each day. Uh, I love to travel as well. I just came back from the Pacific Northwest. So it did a lot of patterning and comp shopping when I was out there, just looking at other small boutiques. Um, what can I bring back to Columbus? What, what did I see? What inspired me? Uh, and then I think from a balanced perspective, I love yoga and um, so I need that in my life as well as I like to cycle. So I do a lot of cycling in the summer here. Yeah. You wonder how she looks as young as she does. <laughs> there she, you does go. Pel she does Pelotonia each year, a bike uh, fundraising bike event where she bikes a hundred miles. Wow. I'm guessing that is a fundraiser for something. Yeah. I know the AIDS ride, I think is like a hundred miles or, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This is for cancer. Yeah. I love that. Oh. Yeah. What when you are when you're mm. driving in and looking at the skyline, I have to ask like where what inspiration is that falling under? Like gosh, I think you know, I 
I went to art school here in the city, um, in downtown, uh, which is just around the corner from the short north where we work. And I've always had this dream of like working here, uh, being in corporate. Uh, all the offices are kind of like out in the suburbs here in Columbus. And so I don't know, I think it's just like looking at the different architecture, kind of what Jalpa said of like what the buildings look like, how, what, how's the sky reflecting on the glass at the Hilton Hotel, like just all, just everything. I love that. All right, my dear. That's you, Jamie. That's me, I'm gonna close it out. Um, <laughs> how do I, where, where do I find inspiration? I think that um, I love, I love the idea of um, ha surrounding myself from, people that are so very different from me. So I have just a hodgepodge of friendships. Um, they, I think, also keep me balanced. So the things that I care about, they could give a rat's rip about. Um, and then, so therefore I get to hear stories about what they're, what, what's happening with them. And I think that that in, in um, just in addition to that would be like my family, like, maintaining humility if you will growing up on a farm and now um, my residency is in new york and being able to bounce from one to the other very much like a chameleon um and it's kind of how i grew up anyway with my mother in dallas and my father on you know in the hills of ohio um and i find i find really inspiration i feel like it it um it's like i'll have a i'll have a chat with someone i learn something that that you know, I, I would say I've been a pretty good listener in my years. I feel like as I've gotten older and I'm old that I pipe in more, but um, I've listened a lot and I've le learned from other people's mistakes or even my own. Um, and so inspiration could become from, I just failed hard. And now I'm inspired to like, maybe because the bar was too high, maybe maybe I'm I'm winning because the bar's too low, you know, that type of thing. Um, Travel, of course. Um, I think you know one thing when I when I moved to New York because I moved to New York with not a job, like nothing. I moved wow, to New York awesome. like a bag. I was like the bag. And wow. what I know about New York is you could have all the money or no money. And it's a city you can live in, and so you just find inspiration by having a humble pie, and then also being able to eat at the nicest restaurant. I don't know. You just it's. So many things I think Joe said, like everything inspires them. But I think it, I make intentional thing, I make intention to have a diverse group of friends. Um, I maintain solid relationship with my family. And yeah, and I'm curious as all get out, which is why I've had a million jobs. Um, <laughs> which is, Joe I, I was like, hey, we're looking for the best. And I was like, I'm a unicorn. Um, and so, yeah. So. Guys, I am like, I love this. I could keep, seriously, I, I still have a million questions and it's like, th this would be three hours long. I, I <laughs> but I, I love for everybody that, that is not following, they need to follow you because it is truly like odd jaw dropping to see all the things that you have your hands in on. And now I understand why. And now I'm so glad I made that, you know, reach out to ask you guys to do this because it, it's, like I said, it, for me, it, it takes a lot to wow me. It's like, I, I've, I've seen a lot of retail and I've been with some of the best retailers in the country. And, you know, it takes a lot to wow me. And it's like, I have to say, like, you all really wowed me. And I can see why you have incredible talent behind you. And you obviously let them do what they're best at, which is, I think, a very strong suit for anybody running any kind of company that get out of your own way and let the people do what they do best. And, and, and obviously you've done a very good job and you've created an incredible company and family, it sounds like, and it, it's been such a pleasure to spend this hour and a half with you. And I'm really, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you're, you guys are a few hours ahead of me. And it's like, I just am really grateful. Thank you. Thanks. We're grateful Definitely. too. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Oh, and keep doing what you're doing. I'm enjoying it so much. So I'm so glad.